So, before I even get into the sermon, I just want to, just by, just by way of introduction, just say that I'm very thankful to be here preaching unto you. It's an absolute privilege that Pastor Burgens has entrusted me and felt like he's mentored me to a point where I can preach a sermon unto you. In the spirit of a Bible study tonight, we are going to be going verse by verse as an expository sermon. I have a lot to cover, so I want to go ahead and dig right into it, all right? So, <clears throat> look at verse number one. It says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. So, I want to stop right there. Let's focus on that first half of that first verse where it says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived. Okay, I think it's pretty awesome how God's intelligence shows right here. You know, the inexhaustible intelligence of our Lord shows right here that God is able to sum up something as intimate between a husband and a wife, uh, that relationship that inevitably ends up with a child. He can sum it up all in one word. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing to see God do that. You know, what God is using here is what's known as a euphemism. For those that don't know what a euphemism is, a euphemism is a word or a phrase that it's used in place of another word or phrase that has a stronger meaning, and in some cases an offensive meaning. Okay, So it's kind of softened it a little bit. So we use euphemisms today. For example, when someone dies, we don't say this person has died or he's dead, right? Even me saying that is kind of harsh. We use the terms, this person's passed away. Right? Or this person is no longer with us. Right? And God also uses a euphemism for death as well. And in the book of John, I think it's 18 or 19, where Jesus Christ is being crucified, he uses this euphemism. And I just want to paint a quick picture because Jesus was scourged and whipped by Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate kept saying over and over in that chapter, I find no fault in him, I find no fault in him. And I think it's pretty funny that he ends up whipping our Lord and Savior. You know, to the, to the point where he's just like, okay, well, now what? And the Jews say, well, let's crucify him. So then what do they do? What does he do? He sends him to be crucified. See, Pontius Pilate, he, he was a politician. He kind of swayed with the crowd. He's a people pleaser. Okay, so he goes out, he, he goes to get Jesus Christ crucified, He's there with Pontius Pilate's uh, soldiers, and then they're beating him and mocking him and putting a crown of thorns on his head. And, and on top of that, they end up sending him over to where he's going to be crucified, where he has to carry his own cross. And then from there, he's nailed to that cross and put up on the cross. And when he's up there, because of everything he's gone through, because of all the bleeding and all the pain and everything he's gone through, he says, I thirst. He's asking for some water. And just to add insult to injury, these soldiers decide to take vinegar, a sponge, and fill it with vinegar and bring it up to the Lord's mouth. The Bible says when he received it, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and he gave, the, gave up the ghost. That's God using a euphemism for death there. God also uses the euphemism uh, sleep as well to, to uh, explain death. So, see, God is using this euphemism because... God is not going to give you the graphic details of what goes on between a husband and a wife. Okay? The, the Bible is not some romance graphic novel. The Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is pure. The Bible says in Psalms 12, uh, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver, pure, uh, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Okay? That, that's, that last part of that verse said it's purified seven times, meaning that it goes through an exhaustive purification process. See, when God pins down His words into the Bible, it's, it's done intentional, okay? It's not accidental, coincidental, accident, uh, or incidental. It's done intentional, and it's done very methodically. Just like when the Lord, Sa Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was on this earth, and the Pharisees were trying to pre um, trip Him up in His words, He had to be very careful in the way He spoke. That's just the way God has everything laid out. See, notice that it doesn't say there, uh, and Adam committed fornication with his wife Eve. You notice it doesn't say that at all? Why doesn't it say that? Well, fornication, I'm sure we all know, fornication is a sin that is filthy. Okay? The Bible says that the sin is unclean. Right? So God is going to separate the clean from the unclean. That's the way God operates. 
Okay? So he uses that word explaining that relationship because that word is pure. But it's funny how in today's society we have uh, this three-letter word that people use interchangeably, you know, to kind of explain that relationship between a husband and a wife, regardless if they're married or not married. And they take God's word that's pure and they try to lump it up with all the profanity of the world. You know, two words come to mind that are biblical words. The word hell and the word bastard. Okay? Look, right now, if anyone's listening that's used to the, you know, the softer preaching, they're going to hear that and turn it off. This guy's cussing behind the pulpit. Look, this is the word of God. I just said the words of the Lord are pure. Look, that relationship between a husband and a wife is a pure relationship as well. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, marriage is honorable in all, uh, uh, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So God is going to be the judge of that. And what's a whoremonger? That's not a modern day word that we use, but that word is a male whore. Okay? And society is so flippant to say any man could just go around and sleep with all the women they want, that he wants and just have this relationship that it should be between a husband and a wife, have that relationship as long as they're not doing it at the same time. It's like it's not frowned upon if, he's, if, if, if it's, he has 47 girlfriends back to back having that relationship. Look, the Bible says it's dirty. The Bible says it's a sin and it's unclean. I don't want to spend all night on the first verse. I, I could, but we'll move on. Look at verse number two. It says, And she again bare uh, his brother Abel. And Abel was the keeper of the sheep, but Cain was the tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit... <clears throat> of the fruits of the ground, an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the first things of the flock, and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So, let's just take a quick second and view just the order of operations that's going on here. So, Eve has Cain, right? She conceives, she has Cain. Then from there, she has Abel, meaning Cain is the older brother, right? And then after that, it says that Abel is the, uh, the keeper of the sheep, and Cain is the tiller of the ground. Then Cain, the older brother, brings his offering unto the Lord, the fruits of the ground, what he did with his own hands. And then Abel brings his offering second. He brings that offering second, and, he go, and the Lord looks at Abel's offering and completely ignores Cain's offering. You notice that? He just like acknowledges Abel's offering, where he says, I have respect unto that. And then he dealt with Cain. See, the thing is, is that Abel was right. And God is going to acknowledge what you do right. And, and here's the thing. When, Cain, when Abel was offering it unto the Lord, if you notice in the Old Testament, for those that you know, have read your Bibles, you notice in the Old Testament, there's a lot of offerings being done, a lot of sacrifices being done. Okay, this was supposed to be done from the very beginning. This symbolizes what the Lord Jesus Christ is. He is that perfect Lamb of God. So uh, Abel is basically doing what the Lord wanted. That's why God was happy with it and respected it. See, uh, um, Cain didn't do what the Lord wanted to do, but Cain actually knew what was right. See, I've heard sermons preached on, on this story. This is a very popular story. I mean, I'm sure everybody that's opened up their Bibles read this story. But I haven't he heard anyone really explain as to why Cain, you know, didn't bring a sheep offering or, or you know, why he, why he did he, what, what he did. But if you can just turn back for me to Genesis chapter 3. And while you're turning there, you know, John the Baptist said in uh, John chapter 1 verse 29, he said, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto, uh, unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which hath taken away the sins of the world. So that's who we put our focus on, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's supposed to be that perfect Lamb of God. That's supposed to be that sacrifice. See, I was talking to a preacher a couple years ago, and I was, I was trying to see if he was a dispensationalist. Because, you know, salvation has been the same from the beginning. And you'll see that in this chapter. But it's been the same from the beginning. So I asked him about salvation and he told me, you know, in the Old Testament, the prophets look toward the cross. In the New Testament, they look back at the cross. And salvation has been over, always been the same. Well, amen. I agree with that. I do agree with that. See, the, these sacrifices that were done in the Old Testament, all of them were to show 
Jesus Christ, which was that Lamb of God. Look at verse number 6 in, in Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. Watch this. Don't miss this part, okay? It says, And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. We'll come back to that. And they heard the voice of the Lord wa uh, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called, it, uh, called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee thou was, a, was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? So basically here, they're busted. Okay? They've been in sin. They tried to cover up their sin by sewing up fig leaves, and they've been busted. They start going and blaming one another. This is, you know, a Adam starts blaming Eve, and then he's actually blaming God. He says, the woman you created for me. And then Eve starts blaming the serpent, and God's like, enough. He just starts dishing out punishments. Right? We're going to skip over that. Look at, look at verse number 21. It says, Unto Adam also and his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. You see that? So the Lord sacrificed an animal to clothe their sin. The thing is, is that what they did with their hands was not good enough. Their works was not good enough. If you notice there, it said they sewed fig leaves together. Did it say that Adam sewed uh, an apron for Eve? Or Eve sewed an apron for Adam? No, it didn't. It said that they did it together. This is where I feel Cain learned that he was supposed to give God the right thing. He knew he was doing wrong from the beginning. From the very beginning, because his parents did wrong. It says here, um, where am I at here? Um, yeah, at the, at the fig leaves. So uh, back in verse number 7, it says, And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now let me ask you a question. Aprons. If I were to come into this church on Sunday in just an apron with nothing on, did I, did I do a good job getting dressed? No, right? Well, God didn't think that Adam and Eve did a good job you know, sewing up their, their aprons either. And he ended up making them uh, a, cloth, a, a coat of skins. See, God sacrificed an innocent animal. Okay? It's the same thing Jesus Christ did for us. Jesus Christ was innocent. The Bible said he knew no sin. And he was killed and crucified on the cross for us. Why did I bring up that story about Jesus Christ being on the cross? Because, hey, we can't forget that. Let us not ever forget that. Okay? All right, well, um, turn to the book of Jude for me. I always want to say Jude chapter 1, and there's only one chapter. <laughs> turn to the book of Jude for me. <clears throat> so Cain is uh, kind of the first for a lot of things. Cain is the first false prophet. And look, spoiler alert for those that haven't read the story, Cain was the first murderer too. You know, but Cain represents uh, all works-based salvation. Cain represents all the religions outside of Christianity. Okay? See, there are, there are, well, let me not get ahead of myself. You're in Jude. Let me turn to Jude, actually. Let me show you what I mean by Cain being a false prophet. All right. I'm going to start in verse number three. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once, uh, which was once delivered unto the saints. What does the word contend mean? To fight, right? A contender is a fighter, right? It says here, to fight for the faith. Okay? Fight against what? Look at the next verse. It says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old orda or ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God 
and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye know, uh, knew this, how that Lord, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward, destroyed them that believe not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after queer flesh, I mean strange flesh, are set forth an example suffering a vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring a, against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of, these, of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. And those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them! For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. So why did I read all of that? Well, if I just isolated verse number 11 where it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, you would be like, what is he talking about? Well, like I said earlier, Cain is a, is a false prophet. And because he's a false prophet, in its context, what's being spoken about here is those false prophets. Where it says, woe unto them, they've gone in the way of Cain. Those are the false prophets. Cain is that, first, uh, is that false prophet. He's the first one. Look, he represents all the false religions in the world. There are over 4,200 religions in this world. But if you were to just concentrate it down, there's really only five. There's five. There's Hinduism, there's Buddhism, there's Islam, and there's Judaism and Christianity. Okay? The first four that I mentioned, those are all works based for salvation. Just to get saved, you have to work your way. I'm not going to go into the details of what they believe. You can look that up if you'd like. But I did mention Judaism. So, oh, well, wasn't, didn't the Old Testament have Jews? Yeah, but those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ aren't the Jews that's being spoken about. Okay, the ones that, that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ knew that it was only through faith, like Abraham. But the Jews that are being spoken about here are kind of what your modern day Jews are like. Your modern day Jews, what they believe, and this is a statement of faith that I have here, it says, so redemption of salvation depends on the individual. Judaism stresses that salvation cannot be obtained through anyone else or by just e invoking a deity or believing in any other outside power or influence. It's all workspace for them. That's not who really I'm concerned about. See, because Cain was actually able to be like in the presence of the Lord. Because people can argue that and say, oh, well, he doesn't really represent them, you know, because he was with God. Okay, well, there's also Christianity that we forgot about. Look, just because you claim to be a Christian doesn't mean you're a Christian. There are tons of other denominations that don't believe what the Bible says. Okay? So I'm just going to go over about 11 denominations and what they believe in their statements of faith. Okay? We have a little bit of patience with me as I go over that with you. All right? So let's start off with the Pentecostal Church of God. Okay? It says, Man at any time, after the new birth experience, turn away from God and die in the state of sin with the consequences of hell to look forward to. So anytime, you, you know, they want... It says new birth experience. So as long as you, you know, you're feeling something, it's like, who preached on that? Was you, Brother Carter? You know, when you feel something, all of a sudden you're saved. But if you're in sin, then, you know, sorry. Uh, the United Beth uh, Methodist Church. Our church teaches we can end up losing the salvation God has begun in us, and the consequences of this in the age to come is our eternal destruction in hell. Funny how they believe in an eternal hell, but not eternal life. Uh, a person who has been saved from sin, this is Jehovah Witnesses, a person has been saved from sin but fails to e keep exercising faith could lose out on salvation. The Catholic Church. While salvation is a gift, it requires our effort. Is that a gift? No. Uh, when we willingly break the bond of charity with Christ, we lose our salvation. The Amish religion. Once saved, always saved is not biblical. If we fall short... We seek grace and repent quickly and in faith confess our sins and continue uh, on in our journey. The Mormon religion. 
We have been saved, but with conditions. We believe that through the atonement of mankind uh, may be saved by obedience to the law and the ordinance of the gospel. Well, they must have failed to read uh, Romans 4, 5, where it says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. The Lutheran church says salvation can be lost. Once saved, always saved is a teaching that is contrary to our beliefs. The church of the Nazarene, even though you may have accepted Christ fully and with all your heart, you can lose your salvation. The Episcopal Church. We do not believe in the eternal security of the believer. No one can have assurance of salvation and know he is going to heaven during this lifetime. The Orthodox Anglican Church. Those who rely only on faith in Christ uh, risk the loss, uh, uh, loss of eternal salvation. It wasn't eternal then. The Seventh-day Adventist Church. Salvation can be lost. To remain saved, a person must continually choose to stay with God. So I just rattled off 11 denominations that lump up with us. And look, hey, it gets even deeper. There are Baptists that think you can lose your salvation. Okay? So it's like, well, you know, Pete, we know this. We know there are denominations. We get that. We understand. But look, if this doesn't fire, fire you up, I don't know what will. These people are damning people to hell. Okay? They're, they're basically saying that they're God because they can work their way to heaven. Okay? Then if, if they believe that they can lose their salvation, then explain to me these verses. How about John 3, 14, 15? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What about John 3, 16? We know that one, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. How about John 3, 18? Where, is, for, um, where it says, uh, He that believeth on him is, is, uh, is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What about John 3, uh, 36? He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Okay? What about John 6, 47? Where Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. What about John eleven twenty five, 25? When he was speaking to Mary Magdalene. Right? He said, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believe thou this? What about Acts 10.43? Right? Acts 10.43 where it says, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, uh, whosoever believeth shall receive remission of sins. Well, that one doesn't say eternal life. That you said remission of sins. Hey, hey, remission means pardon. A pardon means it's paid for, right? So if my sins are paid for, and the payment for sin is death and hell, then I have eternal life, because it's one of two options, eternal death or eternal life. Okay, what about Romans 6.23? Right, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look, you have to have an answer for those folks. You have to have an answer. They, there was one of the quotes there that said that, hey, it wasn't biblical. I just spouted off a bunch of verses from the Bible. How is that not biblical? Look, these folks, and you're also forgetting the fact that there's tons of scripture talking about the blood of Christ covering our sin. So you're telling me that, that the blood of Christ doesn't cover our sin? Guess, get, guess what you're calling God? A liar. A liar. But guess what I say to you that believe that? If you believe that you can lose your salvation, you're not saved. You're not saved. Oh, how can you say that? Are you God? No, you think you're God because you think you can work your way to heaven. You can't work your way to heaven, folks. You can't. Okay, this fires me up. Why does it fire me up? Because there are people that I love that are lost in this. And you talk to them, and it's like talking to a wall. They don't get it. 
They don't get it. And you just plead with them, please. Look, but it says it here in the Bible. Oh, but well, you're telling me my pastor for 30 years has been wrong? Yes, that's what I'm saying. For 30 years, he's been practicing wrong. Look, if you practice something wrong for 30 years, you're wrong. Okay, it's not going to make it right because you practice it a bunch of times. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Look, and it's funny because they mock us. One save, always saved. Right? Easy believism. Like it's a, the, 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 what's that word? It's like a, not a good word. You know, it's not a good thing. Right? Well, hey, hey, isn't eternal life, wasn't that a promise? Didn't God promise that to us? Didn't he say in Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, uh, um, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began? Is that not a promise? All right. Let me collect myself. Uh, turn to 1 John chapter uh, f uh, 5 for me. So why can I say that these people are not saved? Right? Where do I get the ground to stand up here and tell you that people aren't saved? Okay, I'll show you. Are we there in 1 John 5? All right. So look at verse number 10. It says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. What's the record? Look at verse number 11. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's why I can say that. Because the Bible says it. None of this is my opinion. It's all Bible. See, people are going to get offended by what I'm saying. They're going to hear this. and Oh, why is this guy screaming so much? Why is he so loud? Look, did Isaiah 58 once say... Didn't say, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgressions. Right? Does the Bible not say that? Look, it, it's funny because I've been going through like uh, my Bible reading, and I'm in the book of Jeremiah, all right? And you know, it's, that's, whew, it's a lot there. And, and you know, this is what I think about these false prophets sometimes. You know, for people that can't handle this type of preaching, like, oh, he's screaming. Why is he screaming? Look, Jeremiah 5.14 says, Wherefore, thus saith the Lord, God of hosts, because ye speak this word, I'll say this softly so I don't offend, Behold, I will make my word in thy mouth fire, and this people wood, and it shall devour them. Look, God doesn't have to make these people wood today. They're snowflakes. They melt quicker than wood at night. All right, anyway, I don't want to go off too long there. I felt like I went too long there. Um, let's go back to Genesis chapter 4. Always keep your finger there because we're going to keep going back and forth. Uh, look at verse number 6, and it says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So, <clears throat> notice that when Cain was corrected by the Lord, he was very upset. He got mad, wroth, right? And his countenance fell. Obviously showing that that's not what he expected. Even though he knew he was wrong, right? Because Adam and Eve did it. And let me give a little caveat. I kind of went on a tangent another direction. But with Adam and Eve, just because, you know, they knew what was wrong doesn't mean that they failed at training up a child in the way they ought to go so they don't depart okay God gives us free will we're not Calvinist here God gives us a free will and it could have been Cain's free will it could have been just a lack of parenting who knows but they got it right with the second child okay but anyway let me let me go back I, I didn't want to I didn't want to make it seem like you know Adam and Eve are just like the worst parents ever okay um, but, you know, Cain didn't, want, didn't like to be corrected. 
He had an attitude. It's not what he expected. He expected God to look at his edible arrangement of a fruit basket that he had and say, look, Lord, look what I did. And let me tell you something. I, I, I was, a, I was a, you know, a chef, I, and I, sometimes I kind of go back and forth in that position. I've done events, and those fruit displays, the tables, are pretty beautiful. I mean, you just look at that table with all the colors and everything, and you're like, man, I just want to eat those strawberries. Like, it, they're, they're beautiful, you know, but the Lord what, didn't care. He didn't care, okay? So he comes to, to God. He shows God this, uh, th this offering in the Lord. God, it, God is not happy with it. And Cain hates being corrected, right? He gets mad. But here's the thing. You know, God, even though Cain was upset, even though Cain was wroth and whatever, his countenance fell, God is questioning and asking him. God is giving him an opportunity here to repent, to get right, to turn. Look back at verse number 6. It says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? He's asking him, Why are you mad? Okay? And then he says, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Look, look, Cain, if you do the right thing, I will just accept you. Okay? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and un unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. I believe that desire, uh, that desire that, that uh, it says unto, unto thee shall be his desire, I believe that's talking about the devil. I believe it's talking about Baal. Um, and thou shalt rule over him, talking about sin. So sin ruling over him. See, God was trying to stop Cain before he committed sin. There's always an opportunity in our lives when we know we're about to sin. And there's a moment where you can repent, and you can turn from that, and you can say, man, I shouldn't be doing this, or I shouldn't get into that. There's always a moment where you can repent. God will always provide that, especially for those that are his children. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There has not taken, uh, there, is, there has, yeah, there hath no temptation taken you, uh, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but, with, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So God will always try to provide an escape for your sin. See, Jesus Christ basically quoted what God quoted here in verse number 7 and John 8 34 when he said uh, Jesus answered unto them said verily verily I say unto you whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin you know sometimes if you get into sin you might for, you might be able to back out of it or you might get into it and be able to back out of it but if you're not careful it will suck you in and it'll be so hard to get out of that sin you'll be begging God to get you out Anyway, turn to uh, 1 John chapter 3. Where are you guys at? 1 John 5? Oh, hold on. Go back to Genesis 4. Sorry. Go back to Genesis 4. Look at verse number 8. It says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up uh, against Abel his brother and slew him. All right, now you can turn to uh, 1 John chapter 3. So, you know, it's, it shouldn't be any secret that wicked people are going to want to harm you, are going to hate you. That's not a secret. God is clear that that's going to happen. Who knows what type of hatred Brother Carter is going to get for preaching any sermons he preaches, or Brother Devin, or any of us that are going out knocking on the doors. How many times does someone slam the door in your face, tell you to get out of here, we don't want to hear it? People are going to hate us. It's okay. All right? Look at verse number 11. It says, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. So it's clear that the world's going to hate us. And Jesus even goes further into detail. You don't have to turn there, but just go back to Genesis chapter 4. Jesus said in uh, John 15, 18, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. 
But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they, per if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So see, Christ is that example where he was persecuted. And we're going to be persecuted as well. If we, do, if we walk in, in the way the Lord wants us to walk, it's almost inevitable that we're going to be persecuted. Just expect it. Just, just come to terms with it. Just come to grips with it that, hey, I'm going to get persecuted. You know, life's not always going to be cushy. Okay, look at Genesis 4-9. Uh, it says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, Why has, uh, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. <clears throat> when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built it as uh, a city and called the name of the city after, his, uh, after the name of his son, Enoch. And, and unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begat Methiel, and Methiel begat Methusel, and Methusel begat Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. All right. Let's unpack this a little bit. So Cain, right, he basically kills his brother, right? And then he ends up lying to the Lord. So the Lord says, what hast thou done? Now, where's thy brother? He's like, well, what do I know? My brother's keeper? Like, am I his chaperone or something? He lied. He knew what happened. He killed him. You know, and then he basically tells Cain that, the ground's going to be cursed, and he's, it's going to be harder for him. And he basically says, oh, I can't handle that. You know, it's, it's funny that he, he completely folds like that, you know, knowing that he killed his own brother. You know, and, and God even had mercy on him and ended up not killing him, not giving him the death penalty. It doesn't show that at all here. Okay? <clears throat> now, it also says... It, you know, it goes down with the, uh, the lineage of Cain and his wife, and he has children and grandchildren. And then Lamech ends up having two wives, right? The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. Okay, God never instituted that, okay? God never wanted man to have two wives, okay? It wasn't instituted. Turn to Matthew chapter 19 for me. You know, it's funny because you would think, you know, that having two wives, in some cases, like, oh, that's kind of a, eh, not a bad idea. Right? Not a bad idea. It's, you know what? That's just like every sin. You don't ever think it through. Look, when two, I, I, my wife, okay, she needs so much attention. I can't imagine a second woman just like, ah, I need your attention. Okay, oh, what would I do with myself? Okay? 
She's more nervous than I am, folks. <laughs> She's more nervous than I am. You know, look, they're always fighting anyway in the Bible. You, know, you think about Sarah and uh, Hagar. I mean, that was Sarah's idea, and then she's like, Meh. you know, like, what? You know, they, they were fighting. They hate, she despised her. Okay? Look, the women are going to hate each other. <laughs> you have one of the worldwide. Okay? We're, we're in Matthew chapter 19. All right, look at verse number 3. It says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read... Obviously, these people didn't read, because it, it wasn't instituted from the beginning. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together... Let not man put asunder. They said unto him, Why did Mo Moses then command to give a writhing of a uh, divorcement and to put, away her, uh, put her away? And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say, and I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her which is put away, uh, which is uh, put away, doth commit adultery. And his disciples say unto him, If the case of, uh, of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. So, you know, God is instituting ma a marriage here. Where God, God is basically saying that two people are becoming one. Did ever it say there that three people became twain? No. It would be like a three-fold cord or something. It wouldn't make sense. That's not what God wanted from the beginning. Well, that doesn't really convince me because that's talking about marriage and divorce, and that's not really talking about... Well, Deuteronomy chapter 17, 17 says, Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away... Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. So God is saying if you multiply yourself wives, okay, it's going to turn your heart away. And then he compares it to silver and gold. You know, just because Jesus said that you can't serve two masters. You know, and, you know, that's why he compares it with money here. Because women can turn your heart away. Look, believe it or not, ladies... You got the power of persuasion in some cases, okay? Not going to lie. My wife can persuade me sometimes. So, I, you know, we all know that, okay? There's no, there's, no, there's no secret there. So, let me give you a little bit more proof, okay? In 1 Kings chapter 11, verse number 3, it says, And he had 700 concubines. <laughs> uh, seven, uh, good night, not 700 concubines. We'll get to the concubines. And he had 700 wives. So this isn't just two wives like Lamech. This guy went all out. Okay? Okay, princesses and 300 concubines. There's the concubines. Okay? And his wives turned uh, away his heart. This is talking about Solomon. Uh, verse number 4 says, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives tur uh, turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord, his God. And his heart, or in, and, uh, good night, as was the heart of David, his father. So his heart wasn't perfect like David, his father's. So why not have two wives? Well, we just found out. Okay, it wasn't so in the beginning. And it turns away your heart from the Lord. <clears throat> Let's finish up the chapter. All right, back at Genesis chapter 4. Verse number 20. Uh, it says, And Ada bare Jubal, and he was the father of such as dwelled in tents, and of such as have cattle. 
and his brother was named Jubal, uh, and his brother was named Jubal. He was the father of all such as handled the harp and organ. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artifactor in brass and iron. And the sisters of Tubal Cain was Nema. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. <clears throat> and, and Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my, to my hurt. Look, I, I was laughing reading that because this is what a guy sounds like that would have two wives. That's what I feel he would sound like. I mean, let's reread that verse. I'll try not to laugh. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. What I think he's speaking about here, some people like say, well, it's in self-defense. I believe that. But it says here in that, that last part where it says, in a young man to my hurt, I believe that uh, Lamech was getting beat up. Because he, he, he makes sure to describe that it's a young man to his hurt. So this young guy was putting a beating on him. And he had to defend himself some way, somehow, he obviously killed him. It doesn't explain anything. I don't know if he picked up a rock or something. But he ended up killing this young man. Okay? I know there's different interpretations on that. That's what I read when I see it. Um, look at verse number 24. If Cain shall avenge sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy-sevenfold. So, okay, Lamech basically tries to justify his sin here. He says, well, you know, if Grandpapa, you know, if he... Was, was Avenged 7, and me, Lamech, the one with two wives, the cool guy, 77. And you know what? After, shortly after this, if you read the next chapter, it's pretty much a bunch of you know, genealogy. And then you read the following chapter, turn to, to Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. We'll turn to two more places, and then we'll be done. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 13 says, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So God, the world has become filled with violence. Lamech says, Hey, I'm avenged 77-fold. He goes out and kills people. And then what happens shortly after? The whole world is just filled with violence. Look, there was no punishments. Okay? God tried the time out. It didn't work. Okay? It didn't work. So, <clears throat> he actually changes things. Turn to Genesis chapter 9. All right, so, G, so, so uh, God ends up flooding the earth, right? Start, I'm going to start from scratch. Floods the earth, kills everyone, no one in his family is left, and then he institutes the death penalty. Look at verse number 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. See that? God wasn't playing anymore. He instituted the death penalty. All right, let's finish up Genesis 4. Look at verse number 25. <clears throat> and Adam knew Eve, his wife, again, and she bare a son, and she called his name Seth. For God said, She hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So, God, so Eve ends up having another child and calls him Seth. And God says, she's had another child for me. Basically showing us here that there was no more hope for Cain. 
God had, a, God, God had his lineage, which came through Seth. There was no more salvation for Cain. Cain was a reprobate. Okay? And that verse number 26, when Seth ended up having a son, calling him Enos, says, then, men, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Salvation has been the same from the very beginning. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. It's always been the same from the very beginning. You know, I don't have time to go into this. I was going to go into the, the angels and hybrids and all that stuff in Genesis chapter 6. But that's what happens when you take a, 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 things completely out of their context. You know, Brother Devin preached a sermon on you know, not taking the word saved or salvation out of context. Saved for what? Right? Or saved from what? And people don't only just take scripture and words out of context. They'll take an entire chapter out of context. You know, we are the sons of God. So when it says, you know, the sons of God came into the daughters of men, <laughs> it's, it's talking about believers, folks. We are the sons of God. I'm going to leave you with one verse on, on just that. 1 John, chapter 12, or 1 John, or John chapter 1, verse 12. It says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's what it takes to be a child of God, to believe on his name. You know, we have to take the Bible within its context and try not to mishandle or misuse God's word. It was an absolute pleasure to preach unto you today. It's very exciting. Um, so let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much, Father, for this story in the Bible, Lord. We can learn so much. You know, um, I just thank you so much for, for allowing me to, to be here at uh, Stronghold Baptist Church to, to preach amongst other uh, men that have preached great sermons behind this pulpit, Lord. It is an honor. Uh, Lord, we love you here, and this is why we follow your word, Lord. There's no other church that we know of in Atlanta that, that follows you like we do, Lord. Lord, we love you, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.